I know you did did a small piece for Modern Drummer, which I've not seen. Yeah, uh, this uh, up and coming. Yeah. Uh, that, thing. Yeah, yeah. That was great. That was great. Okay. Basically, they they um they contacted me and um, wanted me to just talk about Berkeley and playing with uh, Harry Belafonte and Jaco Pistorius. This kind of thing. Um, Adam Badowski um, called me from Modern Drummer. We just sort of rapped on the phone about it, and he said we'd like to do an article, do an ad on it, mm -hmm. and you know, the uh, up and coming section. And that's kind of how that happened. Okay. Yeah, you won the uh, magazine's Best New Drummer of 1988. Did that surprise you? Yeah, it did. Um, it was. It, it's hard at that time. It was hard for me to uh, stay on top of things. Uh, I was touring pretty vigorously at that time with Living Color, and no one really knew who the band you know was. And we were mm -hmm. out working really, really hard, so I didn't really get a chance to stay on top of it. Mm -hmm. But um, I got a phone call from Modern Drummer, and they said they really liked the article, and um, I was awarded Best Up and Coming Drummer, and I was very surprised. Because, mm -hmm. you know, I, it wasn't like a thing that I compared it to anyone else's interview. I just, they just interviewed me yep. at this club in New Jersey, Club Benet. And, um, that was that, I guess. Yeah. So, so, so let me, okay, I think maybe I mis misunderstood you. So somebody had done an interview with you prior to the to Modern Drummer? No, 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 no. That, okay. that was the same guy. Okay. That was the same guy. He Adam, Adam Badowski was his yeah, name? Yeah, Adam Badowski, right. Hmm. New guy, okay. Yeah, he, yeah he's new. Uh, well, this is, this is uh, I, I could tell you something about Mo Modern Drummer Reader's Pulse, and, and this is, uh, makes the award all the more meaningful, probably because you, what we found with the Reader's Pulse, and it was kind of a, uh, in the neck to us is we found that in a lot of categories it seemed that the voters were going through their past 12 issues you know uh, from the previous year and picking out people right from the magazine that, that we, we were sort of getting a sense that these were people who just weren't listening to a lot of music and, right. and whatnot so but the new drummers category was not like that and if you were never in modern drummer prior to that that's that's pretty amazing that means that that these were kids who were, uh, you know, in. yeah, really listening to the album, and uh, right. so that's actually that's actually probably category probably reflects more of I don't want to say reality, but uh, more of the audience, the, the, the discerning audience, right. I think, than any other any other category in that magazine. So right. that's good. Okay. Yeah, I was I was very surprised, and I was also surprised. I thought. I thought, you, you know, they would just show your, your photo in Modern Drummer and, and, you know, have your name down there, but they actually send you an award, like a little plaque in the yeah. mail, which was cool. I thought it was also great. So yeah. I called the guys up. I was on the road. I got home, and I saw it. I called the guys up and told them thanks, you know. That's great. So if I ever do anything else along that line with that magazine, I just probably thank the people who voted, you know, who voted for me. Sure. What I've done is uh, I contacted Epic Records. That's how this interview was set up. That was an interesting experience, by the way. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I'm sure. I, I'll tell you. So, uh, at any rate, I've, I've read the literature that, on the band and stuff, which is, you know, sketchy at best. So I thought maybe uh, I wanted to find out a little bit about your background, but especially things that, from where you are today, as you look back on growing up, things that were that were significant, you know, that it really stuck with you and that, right. that really meant something to you. Maybe you could touch on that a little bit. Sure. Um, basically, uh, I played drums due to the fact that my older brother played drums. Uh, he, was a, he was a prodigy, I guess. He was six years old. He was playing very well. Hmm. And um, he's, what, five years, almost six years older than I am. He played with all the neighborhood bands. You know, Steve Jordan lived about four blocks away from me. Mm -hmm. And um, Steve Jordan and my brother, and there's a few other guys that were really burning that used to play most of the local funk, rock, or fusion bands in, in, my, in my area. My basement, the basement in our house, was used basically for rehearsals for around 10 different bands. My brother played in a lot of bands. My sister sings as well. Mm -hmm. So I, it was a great experience to just go in the basement and see who was playing and what new band he was in and who was a new bass player and who's, you know. Mm -hmm. And it also turned me on to different styles of music because he played in a jazz band and in a funk band and in a blues band and, you know, some reggae, ska sort of thing. So I always got to check out different cats and different um, styles of music and different approaches to music. And I think that was probably my strongest um, influence musically 
as a kid was just growing up in that environment and so many musicians and being, you know, living in the neighborhood mm -hmm. and stuff. And I, and I always, you know, my brother would um, occasionally, when he wasn't around, I used to try to sit in and jam with him, you know, and they would tell me, you know, you're playing too light or, you know, that you're, you're like top heavy, you have to get more foot, you have to get more bottom and stuff. So I, I, I worked on a lot of different things with his friends and they were, they were definitely very patient, you know, more patient than my brother. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. we're brothers, and I'm sure you can understand how that goes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like trying to teach your, your brother how to drive a car. Right, right, right. You know, when you do anything closely, you know, family-related, there's a different type of vibe. There's a different kind of approach to it. And um, basically, that was the original start. And then um, my mom was really into classical music and gospel music. My brother had just about everything. My sister had just about everything in their record collection. So I would always borrow from different, go in my mom's room, take some records out, take my brother's records out, my sister's records out, whatever. So there was never anything about why I'm listening to rock now, why I'm listening to fusion now, why I'm mm -hmm. listening to straight ahead, because it was always in the house. Mm -hmm. And um, Calypso and stuff like that. So, you know, these are things that I, I look back on and I say, wow, you know, I didn't realize it as a kid because it wasn't different for me. It wasn't weird or anything for me. It was normal mm -hmm. to listen to you know, Mozart and, and Led Zeppelin and Miles Davis and John Coltrane and, you know, and the Isley Brothers and the Allman Brothers and the Eagles. It was it was normal mm -hmm. in my house because that was the music that was played all the time. So, you know, that, that's, that's kind of the strongest pull mm -hmm. of music. And then I decided, a lot of my brothers from just told me, you should really take music seriously and play it. Because I was a sports fan. You know, I played basketball. I was on a bowling team. I was in three or four different bowling leagues and tournaments. Um, uh, I got, I had a motocross bike. I was really into like dirt bike riding. You know, these are the things, you know, you're, you're 15, you're 16 years old. And as much as, you know, I went down to see Al Demiola in Central Park, Wayne Shorter concerts and Sonny Rollins concerts at Abbey Fisher Hall. Mm -hmm. I always, summers, summers were just spent, you know, riding a motorcycle and playing ball and all that kind of stuff as well. Mm -hmm. But I never had a direction to just do it. And then, I remember graduating from eighth grade, and my mom said, what do you want for graduation? And I had read about Drummer's Collective in a magazine somewhere, and I told her that I wanted to um, go to Drummer's Collective for the summer, for a summer session. So that was my gift, my eighth grade gradu graduation gift, and I met a gentleman named Horace Arnold. Sure, I know Horace, yeah. And um, that's where it all began. I mean, we're still great friends to this day, and Horace really, really... Um, turned me on to music, the mathematics of music, time, technique. And uh, eventually, I got out of Drummond's Collective and studied with him privately. And, you know, my one-hour lessons turned into like three-and-a-half-hour lessons where we would listen to Max and do brushwork technique and get into songwriting and harmony. I mean, we, you know, like before I left for Berkeley, we were really getting into some pretty intense lessons. And I didn't want to leave New York, actually. But um, my parents wanted me to go to school, you know. And um, I went. The very beginning the very beginning, the basis of my interest comes from this, the uh, music scene and my older brother and sister and things that were just going around in my neighborhood. You mm -hmm. know, Steve was around the corner and I would go by Steve and watch him play in his garage, you know. He had a Green Rogers <laughs> set. I'll never forget that. A Green Rogers? <laughs> yeah, he had a Green Rogers, four-piece Green Rogers, and, and he, you know. He probably and, still, I bet he still has it. He probably does. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't, I've seen him a few times, but I haven't went by his place. You know, we're both busy and I haven't had a chance to get by there. But that was my first interest. And I really have, I have to admit, I have very supportive um, friends who will call me up and say, you know, Cobham's new record is out. And I had friends in record stores and Disco Matt and Entire Records. And when I would come in, I would say, have you heard the new Mahavish new record? You know, check it out. You know, they would just pull my coat. And you know, I was a little kid and they mm -hmm. were really turning me on to a lot of music, because that's what I did with my allowance. I went and spent all my money on records. On records? On ticket con you know, just tickets to, to concerts. Yeah. That's what all my money went to. I was broke, like, at the end of the month, cause of, but it was great. I but had, I had a good record collection. <laughs> great record collection, and I had great ticket stubs mm -hmm. <laughs> in my drawers. So, so. How old are you now? I'm 25. 25, okay. 25 is past July. Okay. Uh, a kid. That's great. Tell me, when you think back, when you're listening to all that music, is, uh, is there any, um, or are there any particular songs or, that, that really stand out, things that you listen to and like, wow? Yeah, definitely. Well, uh, Elvin Jones is my favorite drummer. Yeah. And um, the first time I heard John Coltrane, music with Elvin playing, I think I totally lost my mind. 
Um, there were a few things that I, a few times I put the needle down on my stereo and never made it to the bed to listen to it because the opening note floored me. Do you remember what it was? Uh, there were quite a few things. Um, there's a Mahavishnu record, Vision of an Emerald Beyond, and that um, Lila's Dance. The, the first time I heard that, I, mm -hmm. I lost my mind. Also, there was another Mahavishnu, um, Dance of the Maya, <laughs> that thing in 10. Mm -hmm. I remember how I tried to, you know, it took me about three or four listens to even figure out that that blues form thing was in 10 4. And it's, uh, John McLaughlin's concepts were great because I finally went out and bought a book when I was around 17 on Mahavishnu music. I really liked the way he sort of lined everything up. It's like when I went to Berkeley, I understood where McLaughlin was coming from with his composition writing, not necessarily song style, but um, how he lined things, you know, how the bass line and the drum part mm -hmm. and the keyboard and, you know, just rhythmically lined these things up. And yeah. it, was, it was really amazing to see that. It was like, you know, classical scores almost. And that stuff really knocked me out. Miles Davis's Four and More record, uh, and live at the Plug Nickel. Yeah, it wasn't an amazing record. You no, know, that's, that's yeah. you know, that still scares me to, to this day. John Coltrane's Giant Steps. There were a couple of records that I just had favorites of. Jeff Beck's Wired uh, was was like a favorite. Uh, Who's that? Was it Simon Phillips? No, that's with never had a Michael Walden. Why? Right, okay. He also did a lot of write, you know, he did a lot of composition writing. Mm -hmm. Lead Boots is like one of the tunes to this day I still love to play. There were a few things, Solomon Funkadelic, Chaka Khan, the Osley Brothers. There were quite a few things that I listened to that really caught my fancy. But the more I got into music, I think the more I started to look at my Tony's, Tony Williams solo records, and I went back and, like, I would go out and buy all the fusion stuff. And my brother would tell me, you gotta, you gotta, you know, if you like Tony on Lifetime, you gotta check out Tony when he was 18. And then you gotta check out you know, Philly Joe and Max, and you have to check out Papa Joe, you know what I mean? And, um, Man, what a great, a that, of, what's that? I was going to say, that's a, he was, that was really a great thing that he did for you. Yeah, yeah, it, well, it, it really opened my eyes up because I would sit down and try to play, you know, I went through my Tony stage where I went out and bought Black Dots and yeah. put on my drums and I tried to get the same sound and the same style and tone and stuff, and he said, you have to go back, man, you can't just say, you know, this is a great record or these next four records are great, you have to hear Tony's concept, and you have to hear Max's concept, and you have to hear Cobham's concept. Mm -hmm. the, the first Billy Cobham record I heard was um, a funky thigh of things. That made me immediately go out and get Spectrum and Crosswinds and all that other stuff. What about what about the uh, first Deodato record with when Cobham was playing? Oh yes, I did have that as well. Okay. Oh, yes, that definitely was great. There was so many. There was. It's it's sad because there was so much music available. Jan Ham had his stuff, and yeah. John Luponti had his stuff. If you were into the ECM thing, that thing was really happening mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. You know, and there was there was a jazz station in New York, WRVR, that played everything straight ahead, straight ahead jazz, the jazz fusion stuff, the mellow stuff, the ECM stuff, the uh, stuff that they're considering now to be new age music. And it, it was frustrating. It's frustrating now. Like I couldn't imagine being 13 or 14 now mm -hmm. and listening to the radio and being turned on half as much as I was you know, in the, in the 70s. I remember all of you. I grew up on Long Island. Yeah. So I used to listen to, to uh, do you remember Ed Beach? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Nah. Great station, man. Great. Yep. That's how I found out about all my concerts. I was a Weather Report fanatic. Um, I think my favorite record is Heavy Weather. Yeah. I still love that album. The best. I mean, all the records are great, but something about Heavy Weather, I mean, maybe it was the, the album when I, you know, when I was younger that just, that was the first tour I saw. And I was like, wow, mm -hmm. you know. I was a big time Weather Report fan. I went to every Weather Report concert between the time I was in eighth grade and the time I left college. Every year they came to New York, I was there. So what did you see? They went through a lot of different Yes, I did. Personnel. Uh, matter of fact, when I was around 13 in Virginia, I was in Virginia visiting family, they opened up for Earth, Wind & Fire. No kidding. Yes, and I saw that show. It was at, it was at the Scope, mm -hmm. Norfolk, Virginia. And at that time, they had Nard and Michael Wald and Alfonso Johnson okay. in the band. Yeah. I didn't even know whether the port was going to open for Earthman and Fire. My cousin had Earthman and Fire tickets, and mm. we went, and I was like, wow. Okay, so you, but you knew about Weather Report before I then? knew about Weather wow. Report, but I mean, you know, I was, my mouth was hanging open yeah. the entire set because I was, that was a big treat for me. You know, I mean, I was already an Earthman and Fire fan, but a lot of my cousins weren't really hip to 
the fusion thing mm -hmm. or the mm -hmm. jazz thing. So for them, it was like, well, well, let's get there early so we can get our seats. Yeah, yeah. And for me, it was like, <laughs> what? You know, I was frozen. For yeah. An hour, man. I was in there. No one could talk to me. <clears throat> I was in a trance. That was the first band I saw. And then I, um, um, I saw the band, I think, right before Peter Erskine got in. I know Alex Acuna was doing some stuff, and Chester Thompson as well. But then um, the most consistent, I think, was the band with Peter Erskine and yeah. Rocco. I think I saw that band maybe three or four times. Yeah, that's the only time I ever saw Weather Report, that band, yeah. with those guys. And I never got to see Omar Hakim. He's a good friend of mine, and I never had a chance to see Omar with Weather Report. I've heard tapes. He sent me tapes and stuff. But, you know, every time they came to town, I was in Berkeley. When, when they played New York, I had a gig. When they came to Boston, I had a gig. At that level, being in school and trying to make a living and trying to stay on top of the water, I wouldn't cancel a gig to see a show. Mm -hmm. I was really trying to get my own thing happening. A friend of mine was a, is a good friend of Dennis Chambers, and P-Funk was playing in town the night before Weather Report. So we all went down to see P-Funk, and um, Omar was there, and Victor Bailey, too, I have to say. Both of those guys are friends of mine. and really nice guys and great musicians. And I went down and met Omar and Victor, and... George Clinton and Dennis and you know Skeet Rodney Skeet Curtis mm. player, and we all sort of hung out that night and, and I remember him asking me was I going to make the show a lot of my friends had, had gigs and they they all canceled but I didn't also I didn't believe in stiffing people you know that's just not the way I wanted to do business yeah. I was playing with a group called 9.9 .9. they were a pop band that was signed to uh, Capitol or Aristotle I'm not sure yet but amazing group and they're very nice girls um, sorry to hear I just saw the lead singer and I just left Boston and two of the background girls didn't want to sing you know they're saved now they don't want to sing yeah. R&B music anymore they want to just do gospel so she had to kind of start over right when they were hitting and they've worked with Luther they're, Luther Vangelis they're really great great singers and nice really, really nice girls and we had a steady gig you know what I mean I was making good money mm -hmm. you know? there was no way I was going to say I'm sorry I got to go see Weather Report tonight because I mean if it wasn't for them, I don't know if I would have made it through school that particular semester. You know, I would hate to think about it. <laughs> so you, so you were working your, working, working your way through school, like, like helping to pay your own tuition and stuff. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, I had a gig every summer, and I tell you, one of the things I forgot to mention about growing up was um, I had a gig with the Parks Department mm -hmm. in New York City, um, where you, you know, they have the stage that sets up in a park with a PA system. It has a stage that folds out. So yep. It's like an 18-wheeler sort of thing. Okay, yeah, I know that. That, that, that opens up. And, and for five days a week, you you know, you go out, <clears throat> excuse me, to different sites all over New York City, and you play. The band basically covered everything. I wish, honestly, I'll be honest, I wish <clears throat> some of the guys didn't get lazy because mm -hmm. it was a well-paying gig, and basically you were doing what you love to do, where other people, you know, my other friends are working, in offices, you know, from nine to five and stuff. And, mm. you know, I felt like, hey, man, we're, here we are out here playing a nice day in the summertime. You know, we're getting paid well, and we should really go ape shit. And no matter what type of organization we had set up, there was one or two people who just didn't agree with that. They were mm. like, well, the money's good, and, da -da -da, and I could pay my bills. And So that was the sad part about it, but that's basically how I made my money. I lied to get the gig at first. Uh, <laughs> I had a teacher in high school say that I was graduating and I was a senior. And <laughs> yeah. she had to be like 18 to get that gig. And I think I was 16 the first summer that I had it. And her husband was a percussionist, a classical percussionist. She was my guidance counselor. And um, she said, don't worry, by the way, you might understand. And, you know, she wrote me this really nice letter and I gave it to the Parks Department and they said, fine. And they needed proof. And she said that I was graduating and stuff. And that's how I got the gig. So that was a really, really strong influence because it, it kept me playing every day, kept my chops up. Um, it was in the summer. It was really hot a lot of the times. And also, we played in Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and Bronx. And I could always run to Tower and get records. Mm -hmm. I was home by 5, so if I had a gig at night, I could still do it. Mm -hmm. It was great. It was really great. Sometimes it wore me out, but I have to admit, it was great. I don't have a dime of that money left. But um, I didn't waste any of it. That's all I can say. But you have a great record collection. <laughs> right, right. I have a great record collection, and, and it helped me out with school and tuition. Especially after my freshman year, I switched majors to um, recording and engineering. Yeah. And after you pay your tuition, you have to also pay for your studio time. Oh, project. man. So it was wicked, man. Tell me, tell me about... Uh, Horace Arnold and you, you're working with him. I was just thinking about him uh, the other day because I saw him one time at a at a club 
Oh, he had a band uh, out in Hempstead. I forget. I forget the name of the club, but uh, yeah, he was great. He was. He was a good drummer. I remember he had a couple albums that he had out on his own. Tales of the Exonerated Flea and Tribal Dance, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right now he's got something new happening. I'm actually trying to get Epic or CBS take heed. You know, right? Yeah. To ours because um, he's got some really great new music. Just to tell you about how that went. I mean, I can't imagine. What kind of player I'd be now if I didn't meet Horace, you know? Where, where were you, how, when you look back on how you were okay, playing when you was, first met him? Excuse me? When you first met Horace, how, how would you rate yourself as a player? Oh, well, I, excuse me, I wasn't a great jazz player at all. I listened to jazz. Uh, I was a fusion head, as my brother used to call me. I always wanted to play songs in 13 and 9 and 7, and um, I did some funk gigs and stuff. And um, I was in that, you know, I was in that era, like now, even to absorb as much as I can. Mm -hmm. And I just happened to meet Horace. It wasn't like someone said, this is, you know, this is Horace Arnold. I just, I signed up for a jazz workshop class. And what you used to do is <clears throat> you would work with Horace, and then at the end of the week, a rhythm section would come in, and you would play. You played songs like Autumn Leaves and, you know. Yeah, the standards. And, yeah, standards. You would go in and play some standards and take fours. <clears throat> He would he would tape it and you would listen to yourself and um, I still have my first tape from that that uh, I listen to now cringe do you but yeah yeah <laughs> but um you know Horace used to always tell me you know there's a lot of potential you hang in there and stuff and um that's sort of the time and era that I met him um I basically was on my rudiment things I knew how to read <clears throat> snare drum music a little and um, that's sort of where where it happened but I, I really wasn't hip to creating my own style you know i was what 16 mm, sure. 17 and you, you know you listen to nada michael walden and you want to play like him and you mm. listen to tony and you want to play like tony mm -hmm. you listen to elvin max you want to play like elvin and max horace had his own style to me <clears throat> he had his own i mean you know he would tell me check this record out check that record out check that record out but whenever i went to see horace play he played like horace mm -hmm. and that was something that i saw and i said you know you really have to that's going to make you 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 know, they're gonna make you, you're gonna have to get a drum sound that's yours. You're gonna have to get a style that's yours. That sort of the William Calhoun that I wanted to create that I'm actually still working on. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's the example <clears throat> that he set for me just as a player. As a person, you know, I'm sure you know him. <clears throat> he's a great guy, mm -hmm. he's great. He's, you know, he's, he's had some things happen to him great in his career and he's had some things that were not so great that we talked about on the business side. Yeah. So he's also pulled my coat about management, about contracts and things like that. So he's really a great friend as well. But I think in the two and a half years that I studied with Horace, he maybe seen a little bit more than I have, um, the level of change. Because when I went to Berkeley, I didn't, I didn't realize it. I was thrown into school here and I met amazing drummers in that school. And I was hanging out with these cats and playing, and these cats were like, man, you're, you know, you really playing? And I was like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? I, I had no idea. I was just sitting in. I knew I wasn't playing at the level of those cats were playing at. Mm -hmm. But they really wanted to get to know me and they really wanted to figure out what I was playing and where did you get this left-handed technique thing from and stuff. Because Horace is big on technique, you know, and he's really has a lot of focus on technique. And that's kind of where Horace put me when I went to school. When I would come home occasionally, I'd call him and, you know, he'd give me a lesson. And um, there were some things that in Berkeley that pissed me off. Uh, uh, for, uh, as far as auditioning for bands and different things you have to deal with mm -hmm. with the school, the curriculum. Yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you. That was the, the, sort of my ne next question. When, why, why you chose Berkeley, and, and then looking back on it, what kind of experience was it? Well, I chose Berkeley because I wanted to go to a music college. I wanted to study music. I didn't want to go to, to like NYU and get in their music program, or mm -hmm. Columbia and get in their music program, or whatever college pace and get in a music program. I wanted to really throw myself into it. And that was the school that I thought would be the hippest. Um, I checked out New England Conservatory and Eastman, and I applied for all of those schools, but Berkeley seemed to have the environment scene mm -hmm. that I wanted to be in. And I think I made the right decision. Going there and seeing the, the, you know, the amount of players that were really burning in that school compared to the amount of students in that school was an upset. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe 8% of the college, the students at the college are like, you know, wow. Also, I felt like the curriculum in Berkeley changed, whereas, you know, the financial aspect of the school started to become big business. 
and it took away a little bit from the musical aspect of the school. Mm -hmm. I was a recording and engineering major because I wanted to graduate from college and I wanted to get a degree in something that was sort of substantial mm -hmm. that I can say, well, here's a degree in recording and engineering and I can, if I wanted to hang it up or if I wanted to get a job being an engineer, being an engineer I had something. I didn't want to get a degree in professional music or performance or anything like that because, you know, in this business you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to play, but I also knew for the money that my folks are paying and I was paying that I needed to study something that I, I didn't already know about. Yeah. I felt like studying with Horace was, you know, the things Horace showed me were just sort of like years ahead of what some of the other drum instructors had to, had to offer. Mm -hmm. Offer me up there. Um, nothing. That's not a slag on any of the teachers, but it's just, you know, when you're paying money, you're like, I want to get something worth the dollars that I'm spending. Yeah, who was, who was heading the, uh, running the percussion department at that time? Dean Anderson, and he still is. I went, I just left Boston yesterday. Mm -hmm. I went back to school and sort of talked to a few people. And Dean is an amazing, amazing percussionist. I can't even, like, call Dean a drummer mm -hmm. or something like that. Dean, you know, totally has all the boards covered. Yeah. And uh, my interest in Dean, I'm glad I studied with Dean because Dean's technique was amazing. And Dean studied with Vic Firth. And he told me how much of a tyrant Vic was about his pieces yeah. and his technique and how you had to play the piece like you wrote it. Dean really got on me. He's like, man, you, you know, technique and da, da, da. And, and at first, the relationship was weird when I went in there. I was the only black student in that class, and it was kind of weird. But, um, you know, I put all of that aside, and I just said I have to really work on this stuff and work on this stuff and work on this stuff. And he, we started to hang out a little bit after that. We started talking about music, and lessons went a little bit longer. And I studied with him privately my last two semesters with him and Tommy Campbell. He, I really learned a lot from Dean. He's, a, he's definitely a heavyweight. Heavyweight. I mean, vibe, you know, marimbas, snare drum, drum set. On the, your album, you listed drums, percussion, so you, you studied all the mallet instruments and all that stuff? Yes, I did. Yeah. Um, I wanted to, you know, I play piano, but I wanted to really get a set of vibes because mm -hmm. I, I love the sound of them. I love the, the concept of it being percussive and sort of melodic, but I couldn't afford it. You know, I was paying for school. I was, I, you know, I was had my drums in a locker and all that kind of stuff. And just getting a set of vibes and getting cases and getting it around school was not the move. Yeah. It was just too much at once. So after my vibe classes, I, I put my sticks down, you know, my vibe. I put the, down the mallets and I said, look, you're going to have to really focus on something. You're not going to get here in school and start getting lost. Mm -hmm. you know, engineering major, you come here playing drums, now you're trying to study vibes. Yeah. Know? So I took my required amount of you know, vibe classes and that was it. I mean, I, I basically I put the mallets down. Yeah. And I focused on the kit, and I wanted to focus on my classical snare drumming technique and stuff. And Dean definitely hooked me up with that. What do you think about the focus in general at Berkeley? Um, from two perspectives, when you see uh, you see like 92 percent of the the kids that were there were like, eh, so so as players. But do you think they go into Berkeley with just a not necessarily a wrong concept, but an unreal concept of, of the music business? Yes, I do. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. Um, I went back, like I told you the other day, and I ran into an old performance study teacher of mine, and Rob Rose, and Rob says he has this class called The History of Rock, and he wanted me to stop in for 15 minutes and talk to the kids. Mm -hmm. I said, no problem. And um, I realized when I was talking to the kids that... Um, Kids were asking me, weird, you know, first they, they were like, wow, he's here, and people were all excited and stuff. And they wanted to hear about the whole hype. Yep. What's it like to with the Stones? What's it, and I, you know, after the first couple of questions, I had to just bust these kids' bubbles. What'd you do? I don't mean to sound like I'm an old man that's been in the business for 40 years, but I told them, you know, it's not about 50 blondes waiting to take you back to your hotel room when the gig's over. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not about, you know, Mick has a trainer, man. I told these kids, Mick Jagger has a, a, a trainer. You know, I mean, he works out. It's, it's no joke, you know. No one in living color does drugs. Yep. No one drinks, no one gets high. You know, Vernon's a vegetarian. Muzzy is a vegan. He doesn't even eat meat. Is that right? And, right. And we don't do this because we're trying to be health, not rock and roll musicians. We do this because we choose to do this. Mm -hmm. we, we were like this before we met. It just so happens that's the way the band, you know, we are as a unit. And don't think for a minute that you, you can get up and do a tour for three and a half months getting stoned every night, taking chicks to your room, hanging and partying. Yeah. Think for a minute you're going to last through a tour like that. So 
I had to let the kids know that. You know, we our first European tour, man, we we did 29 shows in 31 days, two days off, was wicked 12-hour travel days, driving in a van across Europe with my trap case hitting me up against my leg mm-hmm. every time we made a turn. So before you think you can, you know, get high and meet chicks and things like that, that's the scene. You know, think about really why you picked up your instrument. If that's why you picked up your instrument, maybe you're in the wrong business. Yeah. You know, you have to keep that focus. And I was letting the kids know, you know, there were times when I was in Kiel, West Germany playing, and the way they respond to you when they love you is they throw beer. They just, uh, <laughs> you know, we, could, we could not, I mean, we had to say, yo, man, it's not about that. You know, it's not about y'all throwing beer up here. We had to stop this show twice, and then they threw it. We had called the personality, and they threw it, and we stopped. But, you know, these uh, are the kind of things that you have to deal with when you're on. You know, it's not all about the whole glamour of this and the glam. You know what I mean? Yeah. There are different things you have to deal with in the business, you know. I told him, go out and buy Jabbar's book. Read about how his manager took him. Whose book? Um, Abdul Jabbar. Yeah, okay. Read yeah. about how his manager took him for millions, millions of dollars from yeah. bad investments. Go back and find out why um, Little Richard and all of these all of these black musicians were in, are still, some of them are still in court over songs that were yeah. stolen by yeah. a white artist. Yeah. You know, go find out how really how rude and cutthroat this business is. You know, mm-hmm. I'm standing up here now talking to you and, you know, half of your kids and maybe all of your kids may have the album, you know, vivid, and that's great, but um, I'm not like this super rock hero. Mm-hmm. I want you guys to get that out of your head. Just because I used to go to Berkeley and I'm back and I'm talking to you, just because I feel like it is because I want to hip you to something. Mm-hmm. This is the history of our class, and I want you to know that this is, you know, I'm not here to tell you, yeah, man, graduate, move to New York, and you will be a star. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not. Because one kid said, Will, what's your advice for kids when they graduate from Berkeley? How do you make it? You know, and these are the perceptions, and it's really sad. Yeah. It's sad. And I told this kid, man, there's no formula to making it. There's no, just like there's no formula to survival. Some people are on the street and they're derelicts. Some people work on Wall Street and they're millionaires. There's no formula for it. Mm-hmm. You have to work, do what's best for you. You know, and like one kid said, tell me something, man. You know, this total rock and roller guy. He, like, you really smoke Charlie Watts, right? And I want to know, and Vernon really like smokes Keith, you know? So don't you guys feel embarrassed when you get up there and you smoke the stones before they come on? I mean, it's not embarrassing. Yeah. And all the kids laughed, and I, you know, and then I let everybody finish laughing, and I said, look, man, it's not about that. You, you should check out the gig, because the stones are kicking ass. They play and, great, and I know, I know. They're kicking ass. And don't think for a minute they've been on, in this business for 26, 7 years on top by being jerks or mm-hmm. being drug addicts or being lunchboxes. Mm-hmm. It's not the case. And the Stones do what they do and live in color. We do what we do. We open up for anthrax. We can't, you know. Have you done that? We've done that. Yeah. <laughs> and we couldn't, we, you know, that's one of my favorite bands. Is it really? We, we, we couldn't get together and say, okay, guys, time to get some thrash tunes together because yeah. we're going out with anthrax. We still got to play landlord and that's with people and the personality because that's living color. Yeah. And if people want to get hip to it, we got to do it. The worst thing you can do is to start playing, trying to play like anthrax. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's what I was trying to explain to them. So, that's to answer your question. It's a sad outlook. You know what I mean? It's really, really a sad outlook. And, and I hope more kids tune in to the business and pick up more books and read articles on musicians and articles instead of just picking up the magazine to see what Fender has out that's new, what's the new drum kit, you know, what's new per playing. I mean, really find out what the business is like. And, yeah. And, yeah. you know, that's definitely a problem, I think, is misperception. Some of it has to do with the background, where kids come from, what their parents are like, and, you know, that kind of thing. Some of it has to do with that, but I will honestly say that most of the kids that come into Berkeley deal with culture shock. Yeah. They really do. And then you have some teachers who don't give a damn, and some who do, and that makes it worse. I don't know if you read this or not, but I think back in 1983 I wrote a five-part, what became a five-part feature series for Modern Drumming on the, uh, Drummer on the History of Rock Drumming. Oh, yes, I did. And, uh, That's great, yeah. And what I, what I thought I was going to do when I started, started that article was just um, get all the books like the Rolling Stone History of Rock and just pull out all the stuff about the drummers that everybody had found out, you know. And no one... I mean, literally, I was, no one had really done anything with, with the drummers, you know, I wanted, I wouldn't find, who was the guy that played um, on Bo Diddley's records? 
You know, no one, no one could tell me. I said, who was the guy that played Wipeout? Right. You know, and there was, so there was, there was a whole, um, there was a whole history there that just uh, went on. You seem to know, as you were just talking about history, and I was curious as you look back, uh, who would you um, say? Now another thing, let me let me step on my own question here. Okay. Another thing that blew my mind, and maybe it shouldn't have, and I learned this from. Uh, I don't know if you know Jackie Santos played drums with Tavares. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was another guy, and I can't think of his name right now. He played with uh, Cameo. He's a drummer and he's a producer with Cameo. Uh, Larry Blackman. Yeah, Larry Blackman. I did an interview with Larry Blackman and Modern Drummer. Mm -hmm. And Jackie as well. And that's when it first hit me, uh, marketing. You were talking about business. And that there's a whole... I mean, there are, there are black groups that white people never hear about. That's right. Because they don't pick up... They just, they're not marketed right. toward that audience. So I was kind of, from, from, from your perspective growing up, if you could give me a sense of, uh, if you had to say, jot down a, a history of the drummers, you know, who you think were really, really significant uh, to the music. So if a kid wanted to go back. Um, wow, there, there are so many. I would definitely, rock drumming. Yeah, I mean, you drumming. Can, well, let's say, you know, there's a, to me, there's a there's a connection with drummers and yep. rock and roll. Okay. And I think you know, cats should listen to big band music. They should check out Papa Joe. Mm -hmm. They should check out Philly. They should check out Art Blakey. They should check out Max. You know, Philly Joe, Tony Williams, Billy Cobham, Terry Bozio, now the Michael Walden, Steve Gadd. Why can't I remember his name? Yeah, this is Sonar. This guy's voice. Oh, know, that Jack did you know? No, not Jack. He's a real. He's he's probably got the most amazing pocket I ever heard. Oh, Purdy. Purdy. But not Purdy. It's definitely somebody you should definitely check out because he did more things than than people know. Mm -hmm. He did some Beatles records and some other stuff that his name wasn't used on the album, but he did do actually play on the sessions. Harvey Mason. Yeah. You know, is a guy with a, an amazing pocket. Ziggaboo. You know, from the meters or somebody you definitely should should really check out. Um, Mike Clark. Yeah. How about the early stuff? You mentioned Little Richard. Well, the, the earliest stuff, um, when I was listening to that music, I had no, like, the furthest I can go back in terms of drummers that I knew about were yep. drummers that did, like, some of the Motown. Like, Marvin Gaye was, was a great drummer. He did a lot of Motown sessions, you know, and stuff. And I'm trying to remember the drummer's name. Uh, Benny Benjamin. Benny Benjamin. Yeah. And there was someone else that worked. U with, Uriel with, Jones. With uh, the Stax stuff. Oh, Al Jackson. Al Jackson. Yeah. Those are cats that you can that you should really check into because the business back when Little Richie and those cats were playing was so vague. It was so hairy. You, you it was really hard to find out who was doing what. Earl Palmer. Right, right. Did, did all that stuff, yeah. You know, I mean, those are the cats to me that oh, you should go back and listen to and, and sort of get an idea of how music changed and how swing was like a, a style of music people danced to, big band music, mm -hmm. and the and the role the kick drum played in the music, you know, and the role the bass player played in the music. You mean how, how it evolved? Yeah, yeah, okay. how, how that swinging style, I mean, that is the closest chain to pop music, I think, to me. Yep. To me, that whole bouncing bass and the kick drum playing the eighth notes mm -hmm. is, is so close to like pop music now that people aren't even hip. They're just, they're not hip to it. They're like, oh, well, the, the yeah, the 20s, that was that, that was happening, and this was happening. And that music, is, there's a restaurant in New York that I like to go to, around a clock cafe, great food and stuff. And sometimes they play, they have old, like, big band CDs that they throw in once in a while. Mm -hmm. And um, when you listen to that music, you know, the bass is doom, 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 and the kick drum is right on top of that. And, and it's swinging, and you can feel, like, the two and the four and the one and the three. I mean, you can feel the difference. Yeah. You can really, 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 really feel it. And it's like it's like a Janet Jackson record. <laughs> to me. <laughs> to me, it is. Yeah. I mean, to me. I mean, the concept is like a Janet Jackson. It's like a, uh, you know, like a song like Nasty on her album. I mean, it, it to me, it's closely related. That whole pocket thing. Yeah, you're right. Closely related. And, yeah. And... People aren't hip to that. Drummers aren't hip to that. Some, you know, I have a lot of drummer friends who, when electronics came on the scene, their acoustic drums went in the closet. I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. You know, what, what are you, what, what is that? Okay, I understand you're into that, but how can you put the acoustic thing down? It has so much to do with why the electronic drummers on the scene. Mm-hmm. 
sometimes it's frustrating, you know, when, when some people you hear or read about talk about their new original innovative style of music. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's frustrating when you read about someone else, too, is, um, I like to mention, drummer is Jerome Braley hmm. from Parliament Funkadelic. Okay. Um, definitely was a cat. That, that my growing up that I religiously listened to, and I always went to see P-Funk. P-Funk and Weather Report were stop the show, stop the day. <laughs> Those were two bands. I, I mean, you know, if, the, if that show was started at 12 noon, I wasn't in school. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> well, you weren't in, uh, you were in school in, in a manner of speaking, right? Music school, going down there checking out the... Uh... No, I wasn't. Um, I wanted to go to music in high school in New York, and my mom wanted you know, all of us to remain in private school. So that eliminated the, the um, high school of music and arts, which I was dying. Yeah. So I was dying to get in. My brother and sister, they, uh, everyone made it in auditions. They made it, you know, I didn't make it my first audition, but I made it my second time. That was the school that was fame, right? The old. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I went there and I saw that school. I mean, I was so excited about I just knew I was going to get in that school. My mom was like, you're going back to, I'll save you Luther in. Ah! <laughs> I just screamed, like, no. But I have to mention someone in, in our Save You Luther in school that really probably brought out my talent that made me want to go to Jomas Collective and study with Horace. And he's no longer alive now, but um, his name was Alex Alexander. Hmm. And um, he used to work on Broadway. He used to work with The Wiz and all of this, all these different black plays. Mm -hmm. And um, he gave that up to come to a private, a small private school, you know, in the Italian section of the Bronx, and to teach. And Mr. Alexander is probably one of the most heavy, he one of the heaviest influences at that age. Mm -hmm. I was in sixth grade. My sister and brother were in high school, and Mr. Alexander came to that school, started a choir had production, he had explosions, he had people disappearing, he had, you know, the drum riser on top of drum riser. I mean, this this cat had, I couldn't believe it. You know, I couldn't, I couldn't believe that.